Friends, you open with me to Isaiah chapter 49. During this Lenten season, we are focusing on our theology of the cross. And if you missed last week because of the blizzard, (laughs) we opened up that time. And I really want to encourage you to go online and, and listen to that message because it's the starting point. It's this idea that the fullest revelation, the all sufficient revelation of God is found with Christ on the cross. That is the starting point for faith. All other revelations are, are insufficient. They're beautiful and they're wonderful and experienced, but they are insufficient compared to the sufficient work of Jesus Christ, the full revelation of God, which is found on the cross of Christ, the perfect revelation. Today, I want to reflect on what that defining moment means for each of us. The title of this sermon is Something Decisive Happened to Me. You can see where we'll go with this in just the next several minutes. You know, we all have moments in our lives that we would consider to be defining moments. Times when a certain thing happened that changed our life's trajectory. Moments that shaped and changed us. Often when you're living through those moments, you have no idea they're happening, do you? You have no awareness. They're unrecognizable. And yet when you look back after many years, you see how important those moments are. In fact, uh, if we were to put up a timeline on the screens this morning, we were to go around and every person were to share their story. It would be interesting to see the moments that shaped and changed each of us. You could draw attention to that day in 1958 or 1978 or 1998 or or 2018 where, for however many reasons, something definitive happened that changed your life. It was August of 1989 and I was 14 years old. I'm sitting comfortably in the basement of our house playing video games on my Nintendo Entertainment System. Children of the 80s chuckle. That's the, that was the, uh, the experience for us as kids. And my dad came home from work. And like a jolt, he told both of us to stand up and said, Tomorrow, you start freshman football. Needless to say, uh, we weren't happy about that. We had no say in it. And we had never played football before, but he signed us up at the school, and we started practice the next day. We didn't know it at the time, but something definitive had happened to us and for us. As a result, we tried out. We suffered through the 100-degree heat in Yakima and the two-a-day practices. And among other things, it set in motion a new trajectory. You see, my dad didn't know at the time was I was hanging around a group of kids, and we were experimenting with all sorts of drugs. And we were living a high life on, on alcohol. And I was down a certain trajectory, but my dad's decision to put me on a healthy one and to not even ask set me on a new trajectory, a new defining moment. And over the next eight years of playing football, both in high school and then in college, I developed character and courage, a new way of looking at life's challenges. And I have said this before, maybe you've heard me say this before, football was one of the ways that God saved me from a whole lot of destructive tendencies and a destructive path. And my dad's decision to sign us up was a defining moment that influenced where I would go to college, PLU, to play football under a frosty westering, the place where I would meet my wife, Jenny, where I'd experience a developing call from God. I became a part of an incredible community called UPPC. It's not that funny, Jill. Come on. (laughs) And I develop a city uh, burden, a burden for our city called Tacoma, the place that I call home, we call home. As I was reflecting, just tracing back to a definitive defining moment, what if my dad had just let the idea of signing us up just pass by? Who knows where I'd be? It's a humbling thing to map your defining moments, isn't it? We develop anniversaries and traditions around defining moments, don't we? Every birthday, every wedding anniversary, every tradition that we celebrate does this. It's so that we can remember. 
Isaiah 49 speaks to a moment in time that the Hebrew scriptures and the Hebrew people were waiting for. It was the defining moment. Enter into this text with me for a moment, friends. Uh, Isaiah chapter 49, we're going to start in verse 8. That title heading, if you see in your Bible, is the restoration of Israel. This is a big deal, friends, for people who are in exile. And it simply says this from the second uh, uh, prophet Isaiah. This is what the Lord says. In the time of my favor, I will answer you. And in the day of salvation, I will help you. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people. To restore the land and to reassign its desolate inheritances. To say to the captives, come out. And to those in darkness, be free. Then let's move to verse 14. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this is a little tricky to understand. Let me unpack this and keep your Bibles open so you can maybe write some notes here. But I'll try to make sense of this. The people of Israel are still in exile, and there are several images that Isaiah uses to describe the spiritual dilemma that they are in. More than any other prophet, Isaiah uses uh, maternal imagery, feminine imagery, which is a beautiful way to describe the character of God. We know God is beyond male or female. Uh, but that in our male and femaleness, we're, we are created in the image of God. And so there's this beautiful picture of the maternal aspects of God. And it's just beautiful. It's a wonderful way to describe the love and character that God has for us. But it also gets really complicated in uh, some of these texts here in the second portion of Isaiah. Because what's used to describe God is also sometimes used to describe the people of Israel, the nation of Israel. So here in chapter 49, the prophet is describing the definitive moment where God will act decisively. It was their defining moment, often referred to as the day of the Lord or the day of salvation. The moment when a new covenant would be established for all people. But the people of Israel, often referred to as Zion, in this text it refers to them as Zion, they're complaining, they're saying, well, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Maybe you've felt that way at times. It was an honest response. The Lord's forgotten me sometimes. But then it leads to a powerful image of God's faithfulness. And it's done through the dual metaphor of Israel as the mother that is unfaithful. And God as the mother that is faithful. Of course, we all know that in real life, the tragic reality is that that a mother can abandon a child. A mother can forget a child. Even a nursing child. Sadly, we, we know stories, even in our day, where people will abandon their children. We know it's possible in a literal sense, for the mother of a child to show no compassion for the child that she has born. But the prophet is saying here, it is not possible for God. It is not possible for God. The prophet says, though she may forget the mother of Israel, I will not forget you, the true faithful mother. There is something that is not possible for God. This is a limitation God is putting on on himself. God is forever faithful. And this means that God will not and cannot forget his children. In fact, Israel is inscribed or tattooed. I love those words. On the palms of God's hands. God's children are inscribed. Israel has become part of the very identity of God. God will forever be known as the faithful mother of Israel. The Hebrews can count on God, not only to bring its future to birth, but to sustain its ongoing 
community and life in the midst of very hard times. God is a mother in a way that no earthly mother can be. But here's the problem. Israel's definition and understanding of God's movement, this definitive movement, is simply that he's going to take them out of exile, that he's going to uh, restore them as the great people of God in Jerusalem. But that's a reductionist perspective on the kingdom of God. We know that God here in this text through the prophet Isaiah is talking about something much bigger than restoring a people or a city. He is talking about the defining moment where a Messiah will deliver and rescue all of God's children. If you map the defining moments, it comes back all the way to these these. Uh, first signs, these, these revelations, these prophets, uh, uh, prophecies of God's action through a Messiah. It really even starts all the way in creation. But you see, God was at work orchestrating the defining moment of the Lord's day. The day of salvation, the day of atonement. The day that would define every other day in human history. This wasn't just Israel's defining moment. This was our defining moment. This was our defining moment. All of our histories changed one afternoon on a dusty hill outside of Jerusalem. When the God-made flesh man named Jesus would bear the weight of the world's sin. Your sin and my sin. And so it is that on the cross of Christ, your destiny and my destiny was changed forever. This is the defining moment for each of us. You know, a foundational theology of the cross is that something decisive happened for you. Something decisive happened to you and to me on the cross of Christ. It's foreshadowed here hundreds of years before it is to occur. But you must know, the cross was not a historical footnote or a passing moment in time to which we write about centuries later or we consider centuries later. It was the hinge upon which all human history was altered. The defining moment in our faith for each of us is to meet Jesus at the cross. Is to meet Jesus at the cross. And when you meet Jesus there, you come to the reality that something decisive happened to you and for you at the cross. Can I tell you that one of my burdens is the number of Christians that I meet who have an intellectual assent for Jesus, who have some experience of spirituality at some point in their story, but they've really never gone to the cross. They've really never had their story altered. They never really mapped the story of God's grace and forgiveness in their lives back to the cross, the definitive moment. We must start at the cross of Christ. That is the hinge moment that changed all of our eternities. The cross of Jesus. This is the defining moment for each of us. It is the foundation of our theology of who Christ is. I uh, had a football coach in high school. He was a def- defensive line coach. And he said something to us players one time that was just uh, remarkable and profound. It's always stood with me. It was after we'd lost a really tough playoff game. We'd gone um, 12-0, and and we lost our last game, semifinals of uh, state playoffs. And my football coach said, one of God's greatest gifts is our memories. Is our memories. And what he meant by that was that Our memories, when remembered, they can never be taken from us. The decisive moments of the past can continue to have an impact on our future when we remember them. When we remember them. I loved that and the truth that that was, which is that we have to remember. We have to remember the cross. We have to remember what Christ has done for us. It is uh, said that faith in Christ is only possible by our remembering and our repeating. This is why we we break the bread and share communion meal regularly, because we have to remember. This is why when we welcome new members, we remember our part in the body of Christ. This is why when we celebrate baptism, we remember how each of us was washed from our sin through the waters and the gift of grace of baptism. 
This is what we see all through that scriptures is remembering and repeating the Jewish uh, festivals and traditions. All of these remembrances. It has a profound effect on us because what happens in those moments can live into the future. So it is the power of the cross of Christ because something decisive happened for us on the cross. That singular moment in the past that lives into our present and our future. Do you believe that? This is the challenge, though, for us. As we can all be susceptible of just going through the motions of forgetting, like the mother who forgets, like the disciples who have followed Jesus, and just on the cusp of everything he told them was about to happen, they say, certainly, we won't, we won't betray you. And Jesus says, no, you will. You'll, you will forget. You'll be like the mother who forgets. You will abandon me. It's common in our day um, for casual Christianity to forget. For casual Christianity to forget. A lot of times what happens is we reduce faith down to just some intellectual beliefs or a sense, but never really have it impact our daily lives. Or like I mentioned last week, to reduce faith down to personal experience that's only defined by the individual rather than defined by God's revelation. But the reality is, wherever you find yourself in that camp or wherever we tend to find ourselves in that camp, to live daily faith as one who has been changed by the cross means that we have to live in a faith according to the way of Jesus, the way of the Sermon on the Mount, the way that challenges us. We have to be sobered and humbled by what Jesus has done on the cross for us. And if we come to the cross, we will be wrecked. We will, uh, we will see that the cross wrecks any notion of comfortable Christianity. In our day, this is, a, this is such a common pattern that it's disturbing to see how Christianity is presented within our culture. I love uh, the writing and the life of uh, President, former President Jimmy Carter, and he, uh, he admits, uh, he wrote about this one time, he admits that at one point in his Christian life, he was very content to just be a casual Christ follower. But then one day, a, a man came up to him that he knew and said, Mr. Carter, if you were to be arrested and put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence in your life to convict you? Carter was wrecked. He was jolted by that question and the truth that it revealed about his life. And it forced him to evaluate and question his life's purposes. So he looked at his values and his priorities, the use of his money, the way he spent his time and his energy, and where his ultimate allegiances were focused. And he came back to the cross of Christ. And he realized that that was the defining moment for him. And the jolt of that question pushed him into a season of deep reflection out of which came a defining moment decision to leave the comfort of casual faith and get serious about his walk with Jesus. For those who, of you who don't know, he is no longer a casual Christian. He is an extremely influential kingdom builder. I don't know if you're aware of what he does for Habitat for Humanity. We, we have an affection for Habitat for Humanity. He's one of our key partners here at EPPC. And he doesn't just raise huge sums of money for them. He does that, but he also puts hammer to nail and his work gloves on and his tool belt on and he does various projects around the world. And he builds homes for the poor. He teaches Sunday school regularly in his local church. He leads a Christ-honoring life and he has a worldwide ministry of reconciliation. But it took a jolt of a truth-revealing question to bring him from comfortable Christianity to one that was changed by the cross of Christ. How about you? How about you? Could there be evidence that something so decisive happened for you on the cross that you would be convicted of living that out? That the kingdom of God is better because of your response 
to the cross, to the people that live with you, that are in your neighborhood or your circle of friendships? Or do you need a jolt? Do you need to be wrecked once again? That's, of course, the pattern all throughout the pages of Scripture. So join the motley crew that we are, the God's people. There's a jolt of a burning bush. There's a jolt of a lost fortune or a debilitating illness or a powerful sermon or the death of a loved one. Jolts of truth or pain or love force us to grapple in ways we never would have with the reality of the cross of Christ and what God has done for us on the cross. Out of those wrestlings come defining moments where we decide we're going to enter into what God's doing and we're going to change our trajectory. We're going to say, I'm, I'm done playing the casual Christian thing. I am going to live as if the, the cross is a place where something definitive happened for me. Where that cross was a defining moment for me. I love how our new members embody and encourage us today. They decided to step out and say, I am going to be identified with Jesus. And to stand in front of a whole group of friends and say, this is the moment where my trajectory in this church, in Christ's church, changes. I want to encourage you in the coming weeks, we're going to enter in deeper into this theology of the cross. And if you have doubts, my friends, come to the cross. If you feel like you suffer from casual Christianity and you need a jolt, friends, come to the cross. The Lord has not forgotten you. Your name is written on nail-pierced hands, inscribed into Christ's flesh. God has not forgotten you. God is calling you to the cross where something decisive happened for you. Let us pray. Jesus, thank you that you are the mother who has not forgotten us. That your faithfulness extends beyond generation after generation to each of us sitting in this room today. Thank you that your cross is a moment in time that defines every other moment in human history, but our human experience, our individual stories. Would you help us to be a people that are jolted and wrecked by the power of the cross that every moment from here on forward we would recognize the cross as the defining moment. That what you did on the cross and the act of love and sacrifice that was was the moment in time where our stories were altered and that your love was extended to us. That moment in time that lives into the present and well into the future. Lord, would you continue to grow in us and journey with us as we understand more deeply what you've done in and through the cross of Christ. We pray this in your name and everyone said, amen.